The following program is paid for by Jubilee Worship Center, Greensboro. Before the creation of the church, God created the family. And family time is so very important to us all. Welcome to A Time of Jubilee, a program designed to bring the Word of God to you and your family. Dr. Carolyn Lee has spent a lifetime studying God's Word, and she has a right now word for you. Join us now in a time of Jubilee. I'm so glad to be together with you again and getting to know our God. I'm Pastor Carolyn Lee. I'm the Senior Pastor of Jubilee Worship Center in Greensboro, North Carolina. And it's just good to be here together with this programming and to look into the Word of God. And so I wanted us to study today on how He transforms us. Father God transforms us. If you're like me, along the journey, sometimes you think, God, what are you up to? <laughs> Just a, a very everyday question. What are you doing? What are you up to? Well, he has purpose. He has things on his heart and mind, and that is to transform us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. But we're going to look at some scriptures today in some of the stages of transformation. And uh, we're going to begin in looking at 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21 in the Passion Translation. And Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he says, In a palace you find many kinds of containers and tableware for many different uses. Some are beautifully inlaid with gold or silver, but some are made of wood or earthenware. Some of them are used for banquets and special occasions, and some for everyday use. But you, Timothy, must not see your life and ministry this way. Your life and ministry must not be disgraced, for you are to be a pure container of Christ and dedicated to the honorable purposes of your Master. Be prepared for every good work that he gives you to do. Well, he's got my attention, as I'm sure he had Timothy's attention at that time. So he is urging Timothy about spiritual development, just as he's warning you and I through the Word of God to go through this process successfully. And in order to do so, to be successful at it, will require diligence on our part. So let's look at what he says in 2 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. And I'm looking at this in the NIV translation. The athlete who doesn't play by the rules will never receive the trophy. So remain faithful to God. The farmer who labors to produce a crop should be the first one to be fed from its harvest. So that diligent athlete wins the prize. The hard-working farmer must be the first to partake of the crops. So there's no real success in developing Christian character without diligence. Perhaps we would call it being intentional about what we're doing. Yes, we must set our minds to that. So in looking at the word transformation, which really means a complete change about, we could compare that to an apple seed developing into a mature apple. That seed doesn't begin to resemble what an apple's going to look like. That little old black seed, tiny little thing about the size of the end of my fingernail. And it becomes an apple. Wow. The seed of the Word, then, is implanted in our hearts. And this produces faith, which is the most important starting point. Then, out of faith, there follows seven successes, successive stages of development. But before we get there, I want to share something. As, as Simon Peter neared the end of his physical life, false teachers were attempting to draw Christians away from the faith by promoting false teachings. So Peter determined to remind believers. Now, I'm not... I'm not putting myself up there with Peter, but I'm reminding you and myself today as we look at the Word of God. So he is reminding the believers of the genuineness of their calling and the doctrine that they needed for understanding. So Peter 
being highly respected and had a wealth of experience, having been taught by Jesus Christ personally, he spoke with authority against false teachers. And so the effect of false teachings were that believers were being taught by false teachers to live according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. And that is from 2 Peter 2, 1 and also verse 10 in the NIV. Being taught to live according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. So because Peter was seeing that, he said, I'm going to take this time to remind you and to be reminded myself. So in order for us to mature in God and be transformed as a believer, we must make every effort to add to our faith these seven following qualities, seven being completeness. Okay, the beauty of the life of Christ within us is that we've already been programmed to respond to the right input, which is the Word of God. Just like a baby is made to grow and develop with its intake of its mother's milk or supplemental milk, we're also designed to grow by way of the input of God's Word. See, God's Word works within us as we take it in, just like the baby's milk works within its body to cause it to grow. So in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7 in the Passion Translation, it says, So devote yourselves. Devote. Be dedicated. Be intentional. Yourselves to lavishly supplementing your faith with goodness. This is number one. And to goodness, add understanding. And to understanding, add the strength of self-control. And to self-control, add patient endurance. And to patient endurance, add godliness. And to godliness, add mercy toward your brothers and sisters. And to mercy toward others, add unending love. So there you're seven. So let's think of these traits. If you will just allow me to use this term today, spiritual vitamins. I want us to just think of taking our vitamins in every day so that we can build up our strength in the Lord. Okay, so the first spiritual vitamin, if you allow me to expand on that, is goodness. To accept the goodness or moral excellence, another translation calls it. That applies to every area of our lives, whether we are molding a clay pot, whether we're steering a boat, or whether we're playing a flute, whatever we are doing, to do all with excellence, to do it with goodness intent. All right, so it's not just moral character. It covers every aspect of our lives, whether we're teachers, nurses, businessmen, whatever we do, we're to do it with excellence do it with goodness from our hearts. So this leaves no room for you or me for sloppiness or laziness. Leaves no room for it, this first virtue that we're talking about. So as I take my spiritual vitamin, it causes me to want to do things with excellence. And it's primarily for one reason, and that is to live my life to glorify God. Okay, so he who is faithful in the least, the smaller things, the seemingly insignificant things of this world will be faithful also in the greatest, that being the spiritual. Luke 16, 10, and the NIV says it, whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful to much. All right, our next spiritual supplement or vitamin, whatever you want to call it, is understanding. And that's responding to God's revelation. Not just collected information that we can go on duck, duck, go, and we can collect all kinds of information and become knowledgeable about a certain subject. No, we're talking about revelation from God, that which he has revealed to you from his scriptures and is in agreement with his very nature. That's what the revelation is. So uh, in the scriptures... You can be assured of this. You, you're going to find what's relevant to your life, what's practical and not just in theory because the revelation knowledge that comes from the Word of God works. It works in our lives. And Jesus was not complicated, nor was he abstract. He spoke in terms 
that even a child could understand. So his teaching was based on what was familiar. How do we know that? He spoke to a farmer about sowing seeds. He spoke to a fisherman about catching fish. He spoke to those who took care of animals about caring for livestock. So he spoke in very practical terms in order to give them revelation knowledge. So we want not only to do things with goodness or excellence, but we also want to have a revelation understanding of what he's wanting to do. The most essential form of knowledge in the Christian life is that God's will is according to his word. His word is his will and his will is his word. They, they do not conflict with one another. And it's very practical. Where we set limits on ourselves is, is not reading the word. If I am lacking understanding and knowledge, it's because I'm not in the word. It's that simple. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 in the Passion Translation says, All scripture is inspired by God. In other words, it's breathed out from him. It's profitable for teaching, for correcting, for training in righteousness. In other words, it guides us in how to approach life as he intended us to live it. So we can't say I don't have the, the knowledge or the understanding. When I have access to it, if, I am, am I, if I'm lacking, that is because I'm simply not coming to him and coming into his word to find out direction. Okay, the next one is self-control or self-discipline. I know this, has got, it, it, this is beginning to meddle a little bit now. All right, so this proves ourselves to be genuine disciples, a person who's under discipline. Yes, not just one who talks big. <laughs> oh, I promise. Oh, yes, you can count on me. Uh-huh. This will be evident in every area of our personality, in our emotions, our attitudes, our appetites, and our thought life. Self-discipline or self-control will show up. It governs our actions and our reactions. Oh, my. And it will help us to resist sinful desires. Oh, I know. He's... he's He's gotten to where he's really meddling in our stuff right now. But you know what? That's what transformation's all about. That's how you and I are going to change. We allow him. We invite him and we we'll welcome him. Come inside and deal with my stuff. I got plenty of stuff. And I need you to come and reveal yourself to me so I can be set free from that which binds me and limits me. So we're going to hear from our sponsor, and then we're going to come back and learn about patient endurance. This is Pastor Carolyn Lee. I'm sitting here studying the Word of God and preparing for our next Healing Ministries retreat. We have wonderful, savory meals that are just so inviting and delicious. We have a good meeting place that can house up to 13 or 14 people at a time. I also have bedding. We have bedrooms where, for those who stay overnight that come for ministry. But the most important thing is that it is a safe place where the presence of God is here. And I just invite you to check out the, our website, healingministriesgreensboro.org. Call our number at 336-272-9910. That's through our church office. They will take your information. I do hope you will come and join us. We'd love to have you. I'm glad you're back with me. I hope I didn't run you away when I said patient endurance. <laughs> I think one of the hardest things that he's ever asked us to do is to wait. I so agree with that. It, I know in my own life, I am, I'm so purpose-driven and I'm so task-oriented and I... I want to get the job done. I want to make a plan, and I want to implement the plan and get it done. And, uh, and then he says, wait, the timing's off. And oh, my. So that really does pinch for someone who is really wanting to accomplish something. And I think we all find that that's a difficult thing. Maybe we're waiting on a loved one to come to know Christ. There are any number of ways. Maybe we're waiting for our healing to come. Maybe we're waiting for our finances to improve. 
we're hoping that things are going to be better. So we're waiting and waiting and waiting. So let's take our spiritual vitamin, which is called <laughs> patient endurance. Okay. All right. Now, the last vitamin we took before this one was self-control. Now, we can't move to patient endurance unless we have taken our, our dose of self-control, right? Because in the waiting, what is it you want to do? You want to pull your hair out. You just want to scream and holler. You want to kick and scream. Oh, yes, you want to complain. Uh, you and I, let me, let me certainly include myself. That's when we complain because we're in that waiting time. And so we must watch carefully what comes out of our mouth in that time of waiting. Just like the last study, we studied the ten virgins, and it was in the delay of the bridegroom coming that was revealed what was inside. So in our waiting, in, in his delay, <laughs> This waiting time of patient endurance reveals what is inside of us. And so we find that maybe we're afraid. Maybe we don't trust him. These things need to be revealed because, remember, he's the God who transforms us. He changes us. Okay, so, as said, until we have developed self-control, then we can't move up to this stage in our maturity, in our growth in Him. See, this is the ability to overcome tests and trials that will inevitably expose our weak areas, our undisciplined areas in our personality. Maybe that's where anger reveals itself. Maybe that's where the complaining I just mentioned, where we just simply just want to throw in the towel. But these are things within ourselves that we need to deal with, and until we are put to the press, we don't know they're in there. And we may have had victory in another area of our life, but then now, whoo, the crunch is on in a new place, a new place, a new situation we've never dealt with before. And he's saying, I want you to learn how to endure with patience. And you know, the truth is, the sad part is that many may never develop self-control and endurance because this is a progression of maturity. Some may never get there simply because they haven't diligently applied the previous traits that we've just looked at. All of this is progressive. It is progressively moving us from one stage of maturity to the next. So think about being an apple tree. The apple tree blossoms can be blown away by the wind of adversity if we're not patiently enduring and holding tight. Or the young fruit on that apple tree can be killed by the frost of rejection. Oh, there are any number of things that nature teaches us about this walk with the Lord. So the first three spiritual vitamins that we took were the disciplines that a believer should apply in order to walk in wisdom. After doing so, then the following traits will then become evident. So what are we doing here? We're looking at now what is going, whatever is being worked within the vitamins that I have taken, spiritual vitamins that, that I've allowed God to do a work inside of me, now what is going to become evident is godliness. Not because I'm telling someone that I'm godly. No. The evidence will be there for itself. It won't be anything I have to prove or talk anybody into believing. The evidence will just be there. This is the mark of a life that is centered on God. It's the one who has become the vessel of the very presence of God. It's very noticeable. You know when you've been with people who've been with Him. 
you just catch that the atmosphere is different. It's almost as if there's a fragrance. Sometimes there is. Sometimes it's just a knowing. This person has been with my Lord because they're carrying his nature. Not because they've trained themselves to talk Christianese, but because their lives are exemplifying it. So godliness becomes evidence that you can witness and you bear witness to. And that's not when someone's preaching at you or going through a lot of religious activity, but they'll be strangely aware. I feel like I've been a little bit with Jesus when I've been with this person. There's a gentleman that was a British evangelist who had a, quite an unusual name. His name was Smith Wigglesworth, and some of you may have heard of him, some maybe not. But he had a deep intimacy with his heavenly father. And a report came that after some moments of private prayer, Smith took his seat on a railway car. Without a word spoken, a man in the opposite seat, a stranger, blurted out, your presence convicts me of sin. Not a word of exchange, just the very presence upon Smith Wigglesworth convicted this man of his sin, and Smith was able to lead him to the Lord. Wow. So there's more evidence. Godliness is one. There's more evidence that we are growing in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And that is that we walk in mercy. That's the way disciples relate to their brothers and sisters in the Lord. We extend mercy. Why? Because by now I've learned that I'm needing it too. I'm convinced that I need mercy to be given to me, which is undeserved, but I need that. So uh, why is it next to the last of the seven? Why is mercy, the way I extend myself to my brothers and sisters, the last number six of seven? Well, could it be that we find it difficult sometimes to love our brothers and sisters? I think the answer to that would be yes. <laughs> Strife and contention are still around. Even open hatred among, our, among rival groups, all claiming to be the true church. Mm. So the church has some growing up to do, some maturing to do, the church of Jesus Christ. Just because someone is saved does not mean their whole character has been instantly transformed. This is a process in motion that may take many years to pass by before these areas are worked out in our lives. It's an interesting observation. When David needed stones to fit in his sling to slay Goliath, he went down to the valley to find them. He went to the lowly place of humility to find the smooth stones to kill the giant. In the brook, he found five smooth stones. In 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter and the 40th verse in the NIV, I'm just going to not read the scripture, but David went to war armed with his sling and a few smooth stones and the creator of the universe on his side. That's what that looks like. So what had made these stones smooth? Well, we ask ourselves that. Water was flowing over these stones. The pressure of water, of the Spirit, the water of life flowing over those stones smoothed those stones out. And then some of those stones jostled up against one another, rubbing the edges. And this is what happens in the body of Christ. We're rubbing one another. Some, that's when some people leave a church. They don't like being rubbed. But see, this is part of the smoothing of our stones 
and preparing us and getting us to walk in mercy with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. The last one that we're looking at, well, this is still next to the last one because brotherly love is what we're talking about. Caring for the well-being of others, above ourselves. And these are like vitamin supplements that we're taking in it to have God's perspective. And that's how Christian character is formed. By the continual washing of the water, by reading the word of God and heeding what his word says. And these stones jostling one another in personal relationships, these rough edges are gradually worn down till they become smooth. We work at our relationships. We rub against the rough areas of each other's faults. Yes, each other's faults, smoothing them out as we work together in harmony. When Jesus needs living stones for his sling, he goes looking for them in the valley, in the place of humility. He chooses stones that have been made smooth by the action of the word and by the pressures of regular fellowship with believers. So it's a mark of spiritual maturity to sincerely love our fellow Christians, not simply for what they are in themselves, but for what they mean in Jesus, who shed his blood for them. All right, now we're at number seven. The last strong evidence is unending love, which is agape love. That's the God kind of love. This represents the full, ripe fruit of Christian character. It's not sloppy agape, as we coin that phrase sometimes. No. It's no longer just how we relate to our brothers and sisters, but it's our own love for our God and for those that maybe who are unthankful and unholy toward us. Bless those who curse us, do good to those who hate us, and pray for those who despitefully use us and persecute us. That's Matthew 5, 44 in the NIV. Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do in Luke 23, 34 NIV. Stephen prayed for those that stoned him in Acts 7, 60. It's the love of God that changed Saul, the persecutor, into Paul, who became all things to all men that he might save some. So we see a progressive walk of maturity form as we submit to him to the transforming power of Jesus inside of us, and his grace will radiate from within us. And we just, I thank you for being here today as we study transformation. Thank you for joining us for A Time of Jubilee. To contact us, you can write Jubilee Worship Center at 143 Bluebell Road in Greensboro. You can call us 336-272-9910. You can visit our website at healingministriesgreensboro.org or visit our Facebook page. See you next week for A Time of Jubilee. The preceding program is paid for by Jubilee Worship Center, Greensboro.